Last night I dreamt of Kathmandu again. Also that other place with its obsidian shores and sanguine onyx piers, of bioluminescent beings and blasphemous altars to Moloch Bao. The rum usually takes me there, or the whiskey. Some drink to remember, and I drink to forget. Often my investigations have led me to places many don't believe in yet. Perhaps it's better that way. But now I prefer my vacations at the bottom of a glass. A lot safer, and about the best a private eye can get, especially in Los Angeles. Detective Jack Wyler DeWitt had always been rather pleased with his investigating services, thank you kindly. In 1943 Los Angeles, it wasn't a bad way to get by, far better than most. With few friends and even less family, Mr. DeWitt made his living showcasing the private life of the elite when he could, and politicians when he was allowed to. That's not to say he didn't have cases that drove him from the shores of facts to the apex of absurdity which borders the abyss of time. It was near the end of September when this event occurred, and would stain the rest of his life. She came into the room like a velvet hurricane, a browning 45 in her hand and a smolder in her eye. You should put that away, you're hurting my feelings. Shutting the blinds I daydream out of, I inhale my unfiltered Lucky Strike cigarette calmly. I was making sure we were alone, Mr. DeWitt. Thanks. Now what do you want, Mrs. Lamont? It was quite some time since I last saw Jimmy. Half a year at least. People of that sort only come around occasionally because their problems are more important than others. Three times as expensive and most likely to get one sleep in a long sleep. The sort of people who always seem to get served first, if you know what I mean. This matter involves the utmost confidentiality and care. I was sure it did. Well, you see, it's about my husband, Roger. It usually was, with this sort. Infidelity, absconding to the tropics, even narcotics, but there was something in her voice that was past those things. It's been two weeks, and he hasn't been home. No notes or anything. He's not the best husband by any means, but he tries. And as a journalist, he always writes me. I had never been a fan of humanity always seeing it for where it stood and what it stood on, which wasn't pleasant. This disturbed me, though, for there had been reports of other unnatural disappearances in the last month. Oh, and one more thing. I... I just need you to write your name in this black book. She unclasped her Dior purse and unearthed an address book. At first glance, it looked to be an ordinary black book for dates and numbers and such. But upon closer inspection, it was adorned with abhorrent insignia, faces in Rome, some Sanskrit, some Sumerian, other languages and hieroglyphs I knew not. A buzzing or fuzziness of the air also came to play. It was probably from the rum earlier. I did not like it. Apparently, he was with his friends near Griffith Park, some event in the observatory. That was weeks ago. Mr. Marlowe was there, wasn't he? Of course. It was a name I hadn't heard in a while, yet knew far too well. Randolph C. Marlowe owned the biggest import-export business on the Pacific Coast, Westgate International. Many said it was a wonderful front for all sorts of abhorrent deals and black market transactions. Others say he came into his wealth when his parents met an untimely end in 1906, after a disastrous fire that also took his sister. This was after his last public argument, the last door Crowley in 1904, a known purveyor of esoteric grave digging, mysticism, and blasphemous idealism. Crowley was in Cairo at the time, claiming to have been contacted by the entity Awas, and was writing his hermetic book of law. He heard the voice of this entity on April 8th, 9th, and 10th, respectively. His wife, Rose, regularly became delirious and informed him, they are waiting for you, with her condition worsening in proximity with the pyramids. His infant daughter also died in 1906, oddly, a few days after the blazing inferno, which consumed the Marlowe estate. It was all most macabre. 
If your husband had any dealings with Mr. Marlowe, death would be the best thing to hope for. I've heard things you don't want to believe in yet. Look, Jack. I just want to know what happened. I'm aware of some of your past experiences. Well, that's good. I'll come around Saturday. We can continue the search then. Very well. I'll be in touch, Mr. DeWitt. Well, here's my card. In case you've forgotten. But... No, no. It really must be in this book here. She seemed so adamant about it, so I beautifully filled out the book. And... As soon as I signed, she took it away rather quickly, so the edge of it gave me a small paper cut. And perhaps it was my imagination of the rum. But the book shivered ever so slightly. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Later that night, I went by the California bank to see about the lapsing mortgage and other unsavory items. And was disturbed to find out that not only had I been approved, but the entire building was paid for. And there was an additional 100000 in for business expenses. There are a few things to be wary of in life, and lots of funds seeping out of nowhere after signing something is one of them. On Thursday, while I was in Chinatown on some triad business, Mrs. Lamont called my office and invited me for dinner at the Yamashiro, one of the most decadent restaurants in Hollywood. She was performing a gospel number at a dive bar nearby, so I made my way down Santa Monica and up Gower Street. There was a crowd out front. Cigar smoke and alcohol permeated the atmosphere, yet her voice cut through it all. It was around seven when I saw she was waiting outside in the golden hour, smoking from her cigarette holder. One has to enjoy the postcard moments. Before the evening turns sour, that is. Did you hear me sing, Jack? I did. It was lovely. Thank you. We walked into the Yamashiro, an oriental ambience washing over us, which I was most fond of. Westerners are just too high-strung and fast-paced, in my opinion. Hundreds of craftsmen were brought from the Orient to recreate the replica of a palace located in Yamashiro province near Kyoto, Japan. It was completed in 1914. Fascinating. A steaming dish of gyoza was placed before us, along with edamame and ponzu dipping sauce. Jamaican rum. Neat. She downed her whiskey sour and ordered another. In the middle of the restaurant, there was a bonsai garden with a wooden bridge and a koi pond. For just a moment, Genevieve was transfixed, and I saw something undulating in her eye. When I turned, it was gone. The waiters went about their business. So tell me, Jen, what am I doing here? Having dinner with a beautiful woman, you silly man, and getting to the bottom of this. There was a commotion in the kitchen, and Mr. Miyazaki came storming out. He was a good friend. A little extravagant, and I owed him something. Don't forget what you promised me, Mr. DeWitt. Atana waso wate wa kashido, kadana rabe narimasa. I'll bring it when I've got it, Mr. Miyazaki. I could smell the sake on him. I'm sure he smelled rum on me. I went for a cigarette in the bathroom. There was a myriad of things she wasn't telling me, and I could see them swirling in her mind's eye, malformed malevolence, empty nights from empty bottles, unsaid things in the dusk of memory. A man came in, paced past the stall I was already drawing my Colt 1911 in. The shoes doubled back. There was an unsnapping of a holster. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, Jack. She'll play you all the way to the grave. We already know about the bank account. Why? We think it's already too late for you, Detective DeWitt. You know what you owe. 
I had had enough. Kicking down the stall, I decked him in the face. He was struck but sidestepped, sending me into the mirror. A brief but intense scuffle occurred and ended when I rolled up a hand towel around the barrel of my pistol and shot him in the face. Stuffing his corpse around the toilet like a poisoned patient, I cleaned up in the sink rather nicely. A portly gentleman backed in, laughing uproariously. He stopped abruptly, beholding the scene. I don't think the lobster agreed with him. I patted the gentleman on the shoulder. He burped wetly, gagged, and ran to the nearest stall. I walked back to the unbothered patients to our table to find her vanished. A waiter left a tray of tempura with a note saying she'd gone to the rooftop. I sighed, drained my glass, and obliged. Pacific Crescent Moon loomed over downtown Los Angeles, reflections of trolley cars glistening, ants of people going home. It also loomed over something at the edge of the roof, something amalgamous and grotesque, mumbling in myriads of voices, opalescent in the moonbeams, writhing, bubbling with a cosmic putrefaction. And Genevieve was speaking to it. I staggered. She whipped around, sobbing, mascara bleeding in rivulets down her olive skin. To say that it resembled her husband would be an absolute disservice to the imagination, though I will describe best I can. It was tubular and bulbous in shape, distorted with cephalopod-like suckers turned the wrong way. The most awful bit was the phosphorescent ectoplasm that drift off its ghostly form. And its eyes, the eyes of such malice and hate-filled longing. A tentacle from the twelve around its face shot out, writhing its way around an upper leg. Not dog and An awful moaning wail came from where its mouth used to be, and there was a rushing sound. Then it was gone. I'm sorry, Roger. My God, I'm so sorry. She collapsed into my arms somehow, some way. We descended from that rooftop of hell, crossed Franklin Avenue and Hollywood Boulevard, and caught the trolley back to her mansion, down Sunset. She was delirious and mumbling in her sleep. I'd catch phrases here and there, psychopalms and Norvus Ordo Seculum. Of the latter I shall not speak of, for some knowledge is dangerous to behold and far deadlier to say again. I could tell it was the first time Genevieve Lamont had beheld anything supernatural. Unfortunately for me, I had seen all manner of phantasmagoric apparitions and diabolic energies. By the time we got to her home, she had recovered some bit. Enough to kiss me. No, oh, Jack. We both know what happened to him. Carlisle says he saw him skulking out near Mulholland Drive and Mount Sinai. But we'll think about it Saturday. Not anymore. Not now. She kissed me again. I didn't mind so much. You should probably lie down. You need to start making your way up the ladders of society, Jack. We can both lie down. She undressed on the worn velvet couch, got her slipping softly to the wooden floor. Black lace and sweat. Wrapping her porcelain legs around me, we did our best at making something close to love. Hold me till dawn, would you? The next morning, I made a visit to Mr. Marlowe. I knew it had to be done. What I saw last night was a testament to the occult horror that has plagued my life and those closest to me. Of Randolph C. Marlowe, my acquaintance in college, and in afterlife, I speak hesitantly, for our history was vast as it was sordid. Following a lengthy correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Morelia Library of Michoacan, Mexico, 
la Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris, and the secret Guildhall Library of Aldenbury. I had retrieved for him numerous banned tomes and grimoires, such as the De Mastio Catione Mortuum in Tumulis, Le Dictionnaire Infernal, the Mutus Liber, and the infamous Sworn Book of Honorius, banned in the 19th century, and easily the most frankly diabolical of the rituals and texts connected with dark magic. On these occasions, and previous libraries I am no longer allowed in, the custodians I conversed with always seem disinterested upon my initial search. As the general populace may be concerning ancient relics of mysticism, they erroneously believe does not concern them. However, when I had mentioned who was requesting said materials, I was met with a revolting glance, immediately shunned or prominently rejected and thrown out. Henceforth, I readily use the age-old literary excuse now and request them for research purposes only. Yet, what else could these blasphemous and ungodly writings of the vilest abysses, both seen and unseen, possibly be for? Don't worry, I shall tell you. You will not like the answers. My Chevrolet Torpedo Master Deluxe purred as a wrought iron bar screamed open to the Marlowe estate. It was an unsettling place, built sometime in the early 1800s, Time and maltreatment had rusted a gem of architecture. It had pools and tennis courts, gazebos, monkeys, camels, giraffes, tigers. It looked as though a few of tigers had escaped, actually. A greyhound racetrack, a dance hall, a massive greenhouse encumbered by ivy, and many more earthly pleasures that had felt to decay and neglect. A sort of titanic structure King Midas would have taken to. The butler of Mr. Wadsworth greeted me in the cavernous entrance hall. Tapestries and portraits frowned down upon us, cobwebs and what looked like a small family of bats in the uppermost reaches. A portly man with three-star Michelin cooking, the highest level of the time, he was a friend somewhat, and our interactions were brief yet amicable. Whenever I ran errands for Mr. Marlowe, he'd always fix me a plate of fine cuisine to help ease the gruesome labor. Ah, oh, bastard. He's been expecting you. are running a tad behind the schedule. Apologies, Wadsworth. I got lost um, near the second waterfall. Ah, oh, yes. Near the mines. I believe the tigers have escaped. Yes, yes. Well, now I let them out on Thursdays. Good to know. And good to see you, Wadsworth. I'll have to stop by for that lamb coconut curry sometime. It's really quite delightful. Please do, Mr. DeWitt. I continued to the reading room, or library, rather. <laughs> Books from floor to vaulted ceiling, a spiral staircase. This is where Mr. Marlowe spent most of his time, poring over ancient tomes and arcane lore, when he wasn't off on a mad adventure to unveil the mysteries of the world. There was an armchair turned to the smoldering fire, a bottle of brandy on a stand. A spectral voice boomed out from the gloom. Mr. DeWitt, still running your two-bit detective agency. Mr. Marlowe, still ruining lives with the Lava Doeth Codex, I believe. Unveiling the mysticism of this banal realm is no sin, though for most it will drive them insane. What news do you bring? It's the Lamont girl. She just came across some Egyptian book, I believe it's hieroglyphs and the blood it took from me. And what I saw on the rooftop last night, I believe it's related to a Dremelec. And her husband's missing, or so she says. He took a long draft of brandy and stood, towering above me seven feet at least, and walked slowly to a window, hands clasped behind. There are many who delve too far into the esoteric truths that run this world as a machine. For some, it brings wisdom, but for many, not but ruin of the mind. And worse things, I believe the latter shall be Miss Lamont's fortune. A vain, trite thing, never wanting to look farther in life than her own pearl necklace. She now plays with things far beyond her control 
and detrimental to us all. Do what you must, but bring that book to me. I really don't think she's cut out for this, for any of this. I'm sure we could get someone else. She doesn't really deserve Just get it done, DeWitt. He rummaged through a drawer nearby, pulled out a strange amulet. This will protect you in the future. If my scrying is accurate, which it always is. The Order of the Mythic Dawn does not approve, and the timeline approaches. If it ever gets out, I'll kill you, do it. Then I'll transmutate your soul, and you won't fear dying anymore, for there are far worse things than I know them all. Take care of it. You know the way out. I left. And spent the next few days dreading the weekend. Saturday morning, I picked up Genevieve. She looked happy to see me. But women wear many veils. My black Chevrolet torpedo master deluxe roared up Mulholland Drive, white walls making ribbons on the badly draining pavement. I was shaking. I turned, smelled that perfume of pure poison, saw a needle go into my arm, and knew no more. The interim dream was sacred and profane. A sepulchre of roses, bones, and ectoplasm engulfed me. A feeling of acceptance. When I came to, I was bound and gagged, near or on Mount Sinai. Alarmed but unharmed, a bedraggled oak loomed above me on the peak. Small rocks and dirt were turned about in the oddest fashion, like some magnificent swine herd had swept through. Something cold was against my ankle. I was chained to the tree. The faint odor of perfume was still in the air, as well as some faint buzzing noise. Perhaps it was my head. Genevieve stood at the very edge of my vision in the half-light, muttering incoherently with great seriousness. She seemed to be stooped over something small that had an unhealthy emerald glow of phosphorescence. That goddamn book. Suddenly, a sound shifted in my head, frequencies growing loud until it was shaking my bones. The light from behind her chains drastically. My stomach went to my throat as I felt a sink deep into the mountain on some massive slab of stone. The circle of sky above began to retreat as we descended. The buzzing was painful now. I saw its shadow first and felt the putrid gale. Something mammoth sized with large membranous wings silhouetted in the cave's natural sky like tusks and fangs seeping poison. Four-eyed and four-armed, a being of unmentionable design, a flying, flapping monstrosity of evil nature and supreme malevolence. I was frozen. There were organs saturating the walls, skeletal fragments as well, the putrefaction almost physical. The hulking, cantankerous mask huddled above, its four saucer eyes looking down on me with alien intent. Adrimelech for that is what she called the unholy deity in rapture, folded its wings, shifting its massive bulk, and began to crawl or slither towards me. Genevieve continued in that rapture as the nightmare approached. I could see her lips were bleeding, and there was blood flowing into the little black book. She turned to me, tears of mascara turning her face phantasmagoric, a bone wraith doll in the gloomy half light. My husband didn't disappear, neither did his friends. They all deserved it. You have to believe me, Jack. They all deserved it. The things they did to me. But they're still doing to me. The little black book perched in the air on its own now. Illuminated with a glowing sanguine aura, the pages began to turn, the winds wailing from some unending Stygian abyss. There was a delay of sound, a crack, a metallic hiss, and a void of violence split down the cave. Stalactites fell like missiles as a Herculean rumble rattled my skull, vibrating my teeth. 
A Dremelec opened its cavernous maw in agony as a stone spire punctured its wing. Still reaching for me with its six clawed forearms, I went for Genevieve's hand and held it a while. One of those damn windows opened up and she was sucked in, screaming, pleading. The edges zapped around her arm and she was telling me something I couldn't understand. It. I still held her severed hand. It was absolute pandemonium. And still the beast remained silent. It was crawling ever nearer, ignoring the pale green ichor that flowed hot and heavy over the ground. The stench was unbearable, but then it all was, and it was upon me. Suddenly a rift in the floor began to spread, the oddest feeling of Le Père du Vide. I scrambled for a moment and fell down, down, down. The last thing I saw was its atrociously abysmal face staring at me with absolute rage. The clawed forearm grasping where I had been a second before. I was thinking what my last thought would be when I hit the wall. I came out near Barham Boulevard, on the spillway behind Warner Brothers, looking as if I had just escaped a war zone or from Bogart's latest picture. Something hit me from behind and I started. It was a little black book. I pocketed it wandered to the nearest liquor store on Magnolia, drowned myself in booze, and drunkenly meandered the way back to my flat. Relishing the dismal, vain, depressing Los Angeles I didn't know I missed. The rain cooled my face. Later that week, a sheriff's deputy came to ask about Mrs. Lamont. The official report is that she was kidnapped. I hadn't the stomach for the truth, and neither did the boys in blue. So the usual run around to the job. It's what people want to hear. Happens a lot in the City of Angels. People go missing all the time. I keep that little black book in the novel cabinet now. It sits collecting dust next to the Lucrum Infernalis, the Ars Magna et Ultima, and other tomes I will not mention. Haven't opened it since that day. Best to keep it somewhere, no one would think it's valuable. I haven't even told Mr. Marlowe about it. It's an interesting notion, but apparently people only value things if they're in the proper atmosphere. A 1713 Stradivarius is quite extraordinary to behold when it's accenting the fine concertos of Paganini in Genoa by a virtuoso, but you may not give it a glimpse if it was in Union Station next to a bum. There's a whole manner of dimension in cyclopean atmospheres right on the edge of reason, and people don't see or even look because they're far too concerned with reading the paper and keeping up with the Joneses. In Glendale, far in the depths of the night, on a spillway, something bubbled. LAPD Deputy Barney Greif was making his rounds, finishing up a chili dog from Pink's. Wondering what ungodly fish could be making the racket, he turned his flashlight into the malignant waters. A long-nailed hand emerged, and an unclothed woman covered in organs and grime clambered up on the riverbank. Putting on a swagger and the air of authority as government maggots are thus inclined to do, he waddled down to her, outstretching the arm of the law. Excuse me, miss. This part of the spillway is closed to the public, and I respectfully ask of you two if she took his hand, bit it off. As he began bellowing, she can see the rest of him. The stars of the western hemisphere twinkled benignly as she regurgitated his bones and uniform to the water below. My name is Nuit. Ma Ahathor Hecate Safo Jezebel Lilith Crowley. But you can call me Jezebel, and I have returned. Sitting in my Los Angeles office, as the rain pounds, my nicotine stained lips wetting themselves with bourbon, I have tried to forget. And Dr. Carl Linden suggests I see someone else about the morphine addiction but I cannot even discuss these things without being taken for a madman. If I could only forget, but that damn thing was so silent.
These characters will return in Chapter 2.